Welcome everyone to this evening's Black History Month Scholar Lecture. This is an important event for our community. As it brings to the campus, some of the best and brightest scholars from around the world who also happen to be black. I want to thank the Black History Month Committee and commend them for bringing this year's scholar, Dr. Gina Poe, who is a neurobiologist at UCLA. Dr. Poe joins us from California, so we're connecting coast tonight. As the sun sets here on the Atlantic, she's just a few miles from the Pacific, and I'm very grateful that she's joining us virtually tonight. She joins us from uh, the campus of the University of California, Los Angeles, which as you know, is part of the UC system, which is the greatest system of public higher education in the world. And that campus is one of the UC's flagship campuses, an AAU campus where the research expectations are the highest of all institutions in the country, public and private. It's a great pleasure to welcome her to campus virtually, but we must ensure that one day she joins us in person to experience Wagner College firsthand and to meet our wonderful faculty, staff, and students. Her visit won't be complete with actually without, without actually coming to the campus. And so we have a rain check on that, Dr. Poe. Now to put this year's Black History Month in context, it's my pleasure to introduce Sadiq Suleiman, Assistant Director of the Wagner College Center for Intercultural Advancement. Sadiq. Thank you, President Martin. Um, knowing the past opens the doors to the future. The late great literary giant James Baldwin once said, and I quote, history is not the past, it is the present. We are our history. No one has helped played a greater role in helping all Americans know African-American history than African-American um, historian Carter G. Woodson. Son of freed slaves, Woodson was born in West Virginia in 1875 of a poor family. Carter G. Woodson worked in the coal mines of Kentucky to support himself and as a result was unable to roll in high school and roll in high school until he was 20 years old. He then went on to earn a degree from the University of Chicago. And, uh, and received a doctorate from Harvard University a few years after W.E.B. Du Bois. After completion of his formal education, it was hard for him to find a position in academia. In 1915, Woodson helped found the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History, later named the African, the Association of the Study of African American Life and History an organization whose goal was to make African-American history accessible to a wider audience. He then established the Journal of Negro History in 1916 because black history was largely neglected. To Woodson, the black experience was too important simply to be left to a small group of academics and historical black colleges. Woodson believed Black history combined with culture could be used as a tool in the struggle for racial uplift and community transformation. This conviction led Woodson to create a week to celebrate black history in 1926 and to ensure all Americans are exposed to black history. It is important to understand that black history month did not start in a vacuum in the late 1920s, there was a growing interest in African-American culture because of the Harlem Renaissance. Suddenly, white Americans were introduced to the voices of writers such as Langston Hughes, Georgia Douglas Johnson, Claude McKee, who wrote about the joys and sorrows of blackness, and musicians like Louis Armstrong, Duke Ellington, Jimmy Lansford, captured the new rhythms and blues of the cities created in part by the thousands of Southern Blacks who fled the South to urban city centers like Detroit and Harlem and New York. And artists like Aaron Douglas, Richard Barrett, Lois Jones created images that celebrated Blackness and provided a more nuanced and positive representation of African-Americans. In starting Negro History Week, 1926, Carter G. Woodson hoped to build on, upon the momentum 
and creativity of these artists and use history to prove to white Americans that black Americans played a critical role in shaping the soul of America. Thank you. It is my distinct honor to turn it over to Dr. Rita Reynolds, department chair of the history department. Thank you, Sadiq. I appreciate that. Good, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Rita Reynolds and I'm a chair of the history department here at Wagner. This evening, I have the privilege of introducing my esteemed colleague, Gina Poe. But before I begin, I'd like uh, to make a few thank yous. Thank you, Dr. Mar Dr. Martin, for your warm welcome. I'd also like to thank Wagner College Provost Jeffrey Krause for sponsoring Black History Month Scholar Lecture Series. In addition, I'd like to thank the members of the Black History Month Committee for their hard work in creating a robust month of African American history events. Although this year, because of the pandemic, we had to push some of the events into March, um, but still better late than never. Um, and this year, because of the pandemic, um, sort of creating a series of events that are virtually, uh, are, are largely virtual. Um, despite the challenge, we were able to, um, to create a, a vibrant celebration. Uh, now on to Dr. Gina Pope. <clears throat> Uh, Dr. Poe earned her BS in human biology from Stanford University. Shortly after graduation, Dr. Poe, with an eye for adventure, worked at the Department of Veteran Affairs researching Air Force test pilots' brainwave signatures under high G maneuvers. After two years with the VA, Dr. Poe entered the neuroscience interdepartmental program at UCLA and earned her PhD. She moved to the University of Arizona for her postdoc studies to discover the graceful um, de degeneration of um, degradation, excuse me, of, of hippocampal function in age rats as well as hippocampal coding in a 3D maze navigated in the 1998 space shuttle mission. So some of these things that she's done really makes me sort of, you know, think about why I didn't major in science. <laughs> <laughs> After her postgraduate studies, Gina ran, a research, ran research uh, sleep labs at Washington State University and the U University of Michigan at Ann Arbor. In 2016, Dr. Poe returned to join the faculty at UCLA in the Departments of Integrative Biology and Physiology. Dr. Poe's lab investigates brain mechanisms uh, by which sleep traits serve learning and memory consolidation. Now, in addition to her research and teaching responsibilities, Dr. Poe serves as the Director of Diversity in Outreach and Education Programs at UCLA. She is the co-faculty director of the Maximizing Access to Research Careers Program. In this role, she helps underrepresented students use STEM resources on campus to increase their academic retention while encouraging them to pursue graduate school. Dr. Poe is a member of the Society for Neuroscience Professional Development Committee, which aims to further the professional development of neuroscientists with an emphasis on diversity. Gina Poe also co-directs the Neuroscience Scholars Program for the Society of Neuroscience. Um, admission to the program is restricted to underrepresented students. Uh, Gina organizes and teaches the summer program in neuroscience excellence and success courses, um, which aims to help underrepresented students. Gina Poe has been featured on uh, the science program on PBS Nova, in numerous podcasts and science programs. Uh, let me take this moment now to welcome Dr. Gina Poe. Um, but before I hand it over to her, I would just like to remind all of our participants that if you have any questions that you would like Gina Poe to answer, please put them in the chat box and we will uh, have her answer some questions at the end of this event. Dr. Poe. Thank you so much, Dr. Reynolds. I really appreciate that warm welcome. And it's a, such a pleasure and honor to be here with all of you at Wagner College. I learned a little more about 
your college um, earlier from the president and the provost. And I really feel like you guys are doing a great job and in navigating this crisis and COVID. And, and it sounds like a fantastic place. Actually, any place that has my colleague, Dr. Reynolds, as a professor and chair, um, has its head on its shoulders. So um, thanks so much for this invitation to be here. And it's my pleasure. I want to also reiterate that if you have any questions as I talk, please put them in the chat. I will try and answer them as I go along. And if I can't do that, we can do it afterward for sure. Um, Dr. Reynolds, I think I won't be able to see the chat from everyone until afterward. Is that the case or? If you wanted to, you could look at it now, but I think that's a distraction, but I'll sort of keep um, a running tally of the questions and present um, sort of the ones that are recurring. Yeah, I, I would love to see your reactions as it, as it goes along. So, all right, um, I'm going to do this lecture mostly from slides. So I hope that's not a problem for you all, but it's, um, I have a visual memory, so that will help me to see what I'm talking about here. So um, I will share my screen with you and start the talk. So here are some students in my um, lab right now, Michelle Frazier, Yesenia Cabrera, Raquel Guthrie, and Ward Pettibone. I actually have one more new student named Shante Ayala from Puerto Rico. And um, these are the graduate student heroes doing the work I'll talk about today. Um, and my research is on the function of sleep for learning and memory. And I'm gonna tell you about what is happening during sleep to help you um, remember your college classes better, um, not only for the exam, but for the rest of your lives. Uh, these are the institutions that have funded um, my research. Before I was at UCLA five years ago, I came from the University of Michigan where I was at, I was there as a faculty member for 15 years. I did my PhD at UCLA and so I'm coming home. In fact, my laboratory is across the hall from where I did my dissertation. So it's, it's great. My dissertation advisor is still there. I still pop in on him and ask him questions. It feels, it feels great. So the NIH um, funds, has funded my research over the past 22 years and has done so um, at the taxpayer's expense. So I wanna thank all of the taxpayers. All right, so this is a brief history of uh, my career. It's not been straightforward. I did not think I was gonna be a scientist. I was born here in 1965 to my father who was in the Marines at the time at Camp Pendleton and my mother who was a waitress and a diner um, that served him coffee uh, in the mornings. And so um, they fell in love and got married and had me and then my little brother. And um, even though they separated and divorced when I was only two, both of them always served as wonderful role models to me um, about the importance of education and how knowledge is power and education will get you ahead and allow you to do anything you want. The world really will be your oyster. They told me and encouraged me my whole life that I could do anything I wanted to do. Um, and I believed them because I trusted these people. Uh, so uh, yeah, so um, ultimately I, I got my undergraduate education from Stanford and um, you know, my mom raised us as a single parent mom and we were pretty poor, uh, but she always you know, switched us from one school to another to make sure we were getting a good education. Um, and we moved to schools probably every two years, my brother and I, just because she would be unhappy with what kind of education we were getting in one place and would switch us to another place. Um, yeah, uh, and then I was, I, when I was at Stanford, I thought I would like to do public health. And I wanted a PhD in public health that was a professional PhD because I thought I wanted to work for the World Health Organization and um, help with healthcare distribution around the world. Uh, but when I graduated in 87, there wasn't any professional PhD program in public health. They had a lot of academic PhD programs, but nothing professional. There was going to be one at Columbia. Columbia College um, promised me that two years later they would open one and so just hang on. So I needed a job in the meantime. And um, after 
losing money waitressing, <laughs> I um, found a research tech position uh, and it was the first time I've ever done, I had ever done research. And it was a really great opportunity where I got to hook up fighter pilots with EEGs that we made a portable system that we created and monitor their rain waves while they flew F-16s around um, Edwards Air Force Base. And that's when I realized that research was not a boring thing that you do in a white coat with a, your hair back in a tight bun, um, but it's a team effort and you really get to ask, ask interesting questions and answer them. Um, so that was my, my introduction there. This is um, my father, Sam, and my brother, Tamir, who was um, just a year younger than me back uh, some years ago. And there's at my wedding, my, my dad. And here's my mom. And um, when I was 16, she got remarried to this wonderful man, William Poe, who is, um, who is still my stepdad and is a really warm, supportive person in my life. So, yeah, so I um, then uh, while I was a research tech, I was invited to this this program, um, a summer a summer uh, research conference where they assembled all of the people who did re sleep research in the whole world. So this picture encompasses pretty much 100% of the sleep researchers in 1988. Um, and a few more like me who wasn't in it at the time, but you know, I was just invited because I was um, working in this research lab of Barry Sturman. And it was such a nice family um, type environment. People were so sweet. All of these, you know, really high and mighty sleep researchers shared with the trainees like me the fact that we had no idea what we were doing, you know, in this, for this third of our lives. And they had all kinds of hypotheses and they'd tried out various things and it wasn't working out. And um, we were just very open and honest about the critical unanswered questions. And it made me realize that me, uh, a recent graduate of an undergraduate um, college, I could make a difference and I could ask good questions myself and, and design experiments myself and, and conduct them and you know push the field forward. So it was really empowering and it helped me understand that I could belong in this, this field of study. Um, Michael Chase was the one who organized these conferences and he's the one who convinced me to apply to graduate school in neuroscience um, at the program and he was running, which was um, in sleep at UCLA. So at the time um, that I entered sleep research, we believed that really it was only mammals and birds that had two states of sleep, which was the deep slow wave state of sleep and rapid eye movement state of sleep. That was really only these two um, types of animals that did this. And I show here a cat because it is my cat who's sitting here in the window box right next to me. And um, it's a predator and predators generally sleep much better than prey do. Um, and then I also show the giraffe because the giraffe is the mammal that sleeps the least amount of time each day. It's a prey species. And you can imagine that when the giraffe goes to sleep, well, they can sleep in this position. They also, if they go into REM sleep, which is that second state of sleep, the dream state of sleep, they have what all animals seem to have in REM sleep, which is atonia. They, their muscles are actively inhibited, so they don't act out the dreams. And that giraffe has to lay that long neck down on the grass um, in order to be going into atonia. Horses also have to lay down when they go into REM sleep. And so it's an extremely vulnerable state for a prey animal to be in. Um, birds can go into it and they do, but it's only for, you know, cats have REM sleep for 15 long minutes at a time. Giraffes, 15 minutes is the total amount of REM sleep that they get per day versus cats, you know, they get 16 hours of sleep and every 45 minutes they have 15 minutes of REM. So it's a lot, lot more. And then for birds, they have very short sleep cycles and they go into REM sleep for 15 seconds at a time. So uh, yeah, so you can see, but we all sleep from whales to worms. Every creature studied sleeps and in all animals that have um, 
and EEG, which is brain waves that we can measure, uh, we can see that they have um, these two states of sleep, one rapid eye movement and the other uh, non-REM sleep. But even those that don't have a brain, we can measure the electrical activity from, the jellyfish here doesn't even have a centralized nervous system like we have, but what they do sleep also, and you can disturb them of the sleep by um, giving them a puff of air or a puff of water. Um, you can see that this is the pulse rate when they're awake, but when they're asleep, their pulse rate is about half of that um, to a third of that. And you can deprive them of this state of sleep and they will have to get more of it. So that it's homeostatically regulated in all animals, including humans. Um, if we get less of it, we need more of it later. Um, so they have this slow pulsing state of sleep here. Um, this is a pulse rate at day and this is a pulse rate at night. But they also have this second state of sleep where they're atonic. They are not moving at all. And that's up to 20 seconds at a time. They are atonic like this. And so, um, you know, when we are in our dream state of sleep, we're atonic. Are jellyfish also dreaming? We have no idea. In fact, the second state of sleep hasn't even been named yet. And I wonder what you would call it. In eyes, with animals with eyes that move, we call it REM sleep, but, um, you know, jellyfish, most jellyfish don't have eyes. So we have to come up with a new name for it in them. So in this state, we're vulnerable to predation our energy savings is actually minimal because our brains are so active when we're asleep that we only save about a slice of bread worth of um, energy when we're asleep versus lying there awake and, um, and uh, responding to our environment. We're also not seeking a mate. So it doesn't seem to be really like um, a good adaptation, a good time, way to spend our time. There must be something really essential going on during this state. So I went to UCLA to do my PhD. And um, this is the laboratory in which I did my PhD. These two are graduate students with me. Um, and this, this is my advisor, Ron Harper and his wife. These are a couple of researchers that um, worked just across the way. And now my research lab at UCLA is just across the hall from this lab. So I get to pop in on Ron Harper and, and still ask him for advice. He's a, a wonderful advisor. Uh, and this is Dave Rector, who we, together what we did is we invented a new way to look at brain activity that could look instead of at um, single neurons or um, just, you know, mass activity, electrical activity, we could actually see neurons that were on versus off in the freely behaving cat. And we studied the cat because it's, there's champion sleepers. Um, and across sleep-waking states and size and apnea. And this is the first um, research project that I did all on my own. And so it was fun because I could be at the cutting edge of not only neuro neuroscience research and sleep research, but also you know, developing new technologies to, to measure activity in the brain. And this technology is still being used today. Um, so uh, one of the lecturers who came to UCLA when I was a graduate student there uh, had just published a paper, um, John Lisman had just published a paper showing that if he took a slice of the hippocampus, and the hippocampus is a structure deep in our brains and our temporal lobes that is essential for new learning and memory. And it's kind of a early storage place for any kind of new associative memory like the place and a name, um, a name and a face, those kinds of things that we're associating together. The hippocampus is essential for that. And um, if you took a slice of this hippocampus and added a neurotransmitter that's normally there when we're awake and learning, um, that's called acetylcholine, you could get a rhythm in, the, in this hippocampal slice that's present inside of our brains as well when we're learning, which is called the theta rhythm. It's about five to 10 beats per second um, of, of, uh, of a electrical potential that allows neurons to fire here at the peaks or they're silent here at the troughs. And what he did is he stimulated this hippocampal slice at the peaks of theta and he got what we know to be the building block for learning and memory, which is called long-term potentiation. You can see that any one neuron here in the brain is covered with 
synapses. Every red dot here is a synapse coming in from another neuron. And that's why our, how our brain works is that synapse, neurons talk to one another. And um, so what the building block for learning is, is when two neurons are firing together, one neuron is talking a lot to the other, the connections between them get strengthened. That's called long-term potentiation. They get potentiated. And then um, it was also hypothesized that, especially in the hippocampus, which is a small structure, which is only important in the short term for learning, ultimately this, you know, you can call it the RAM system in our brain, memories get written to long-term storage, which is all over our, our cortex. Um, then if um, we want to continue a lifelong uh, ability to learn, we're going to have to erase this short-term memory structure so that it can be free to encode something new the next day. And um, so the, the mechanism for that is called depotentiation or long-term depression. So it's the opposite of potentiation. And what John Lisman and P Patricia Huerta found and Constantine Pavlides had found a few years earlier is that if you stimulate at the troughs of theta instead of the peaks, this is the time when most neurons are farthest away from their action potential threshold, so they're least able to respond. That's when you get depotentiation. So he had done this in the slice when with addition of acetylcholine, and that is a REM sleep-like neurochemical environment. In REM sleep, we have theta going on in our brains, and we also have a lots of acetylcholine in our brains. And so what they found is in a REM sleep-like environment, you can get depotentiation, which was really exciting because previous to this, uh, you couldn't get depotentiation except with a very strange kind of stimulation pattern. So, um, you know, I sort of filed away that bit of information. I wasn't doing research on learning and memory yet at that time. It's hard to keep, teach a cat anything. I mean, they're very smart, but they don't really want to run mazes for you. Um, but I went to the University of Arizona for my postdoctoral. So I got my PhD and I went to the University of Arizona for postdoctoral studies. That's typical in the field of neurosciences. After you get your PhD, you do a few more years of training just to kind of stock up on, on techniques and, um, and get ready to launch your own research lab and you get some data so that you can la launch your own research lab. And I wanted to know in, um, when I went there is what is happening in the brains of animals who are learning? How are neurons firing in relation to this theta rhythm that I described to you before, this five to 10 cycles per second rhythm that's present when animals are learning and also when they're in REM sleep? So I'm just going to quickly tell you what sleep looks like in humans um, over the course of a night. This is actually from the Fitbit of uh, my sister-in-law, Sandy, who has this idyllic sleep pattern. She went to bed at 10 and woke up at six in the morning and she went from wakefulness into this stage two sleep. It's called um, N2 sleep and then into deep slow wave sleep. And you can see that you have much more of this deep slow wave sleep in the early hours of the night than the late hours of the night. And that is typical. Also, you have more slow wave sleep when you're young than when you're older. And so I'm gonna tell you quickly what this slow wave sleep state does, but one of the things you do see in the brain is these slow waves, um, big slow waves that sweep through the brain during that state. So stage two is something that you go into and out of. It was actually fairly ignored in the sleep community because it was so sometimes so transient. And so people thought, well, it's not really an important state. But we now know that during stage two sleep, we have these things called sleep spindles, which we now know are really important. Um, and then again, like I said before, you have lots of slow wave sleep in the early part, but not the late part. Um, and in this stage two sleep, when you have these sleep spindles, um, now we know that this is a time when we are consolidating those memories from the hippocampus to the cortex. Um, and then we go into REM sleep, which is um, uh, where that theta with rhythm appears. And uh, you can see where, where it occurs throughout the night. That's that dream state. Okay, so... Um, Interestingly, sleep happens in cycles. We have about 
90 minute cycles and we have about five of them and in a typical eight hours of sleep per night. And um, it appears that these cycles are important for some reason. And I will show you, these are the slow waves. This is the transition to REM sleep. Um, we go from waking to slow wave sleep and then transition to REM sleep and then back. And you go back and forth about five times per night between slow wave sleep and REM sleep before your brain is done with whatever tasks it's doing and you can wake up. If you are sleep deprived, um, your sleep states are all fighting for the same sliver of time after you you're, you're enable yourself to fall asleep. They all want that period of time to make up for the time you lost. And so they're all trying to happen at the same time. And that's when sleep disorders come in, um, which can be scary for those watching, for example, your child um, experience a night terror. Night terrors are because your child's emotional system is activated like it is in REM sleep, um, but they're also not um, it actively inhibiting their muscles. So you can hear their cries of their emotional system, but they're also unconscious and don't remember their dreams. You can have it sleep paralysis. I don't know if any of you've ever had sleep paralysis when you wake up, but yet you still can't move. And that's because part of your brain is still atonic. It is paralyzing your muscles. So you don't act out your dream, even though now you're awake. That's another dissociated state. There are confusional arousals where you're conscious and unconscious at the same time. You don't know where you are. There's um, sleepwalking and talking. That happens a lot more with sleep deprivation. And um, there's REM behavior disorder, which is even more serious than sleepwalking, which is out of slow sleep because REM behavior disorder happens out of REM sleep when you're acting out these really vivid dreams and you're not, not atonic, you're not experiencing the atonia. It's kind of the opposite of sleep paralysis. You are dreaming, but you're acting out those dreams. Um, that can be a sign of a more serious kind of neurodegenerative disorder. It's one of the earliest signs of Parkinson's disease, for example. And um, so if you are getting a lot of it, I would suggest you go to your doctor. So what's happening? Well, in slow wave sleep, we now know, just recently have learned that it's really for um, cleaning up our brain and repairing broken structures. And how that happens is that um, we are, in, with those slow waves, the slow waves are actually sweeping through our brain and sweeping the trash generated during wakefulness into the glymphatic system. And um, so it's another, also we are able to restore our metabolism, adenosine, which is, um, made by um, using energy. Every cell in our body uses adenosine and converts it to ATP, which is an energy packet. Um, during sleep, that's when the majority, the bulk of your adenosine is made into ATP and proteins are synthesized. Also during transition to REM, we're integrating and consolidating with those sleep spindles. And in REM sleep, we're cleaning and you know, reimagining and um, our are um, creating new realities and sol solving problems. Okay, so um, yes, I have a good question already and I will answer it. It's about slow wave sleep. Does it differ in people with mental health conditions like depression? And I will definitely um, be answering that. So just to show you what the lymphatic system looks like, this is something that was just discovered about five years ago. Um, we didn't know that the brain had a lymph system, just like the rest of our body does um, until about five or seven years ago. And now we realize that not only do we have this cleaning system, but slow waves sweep trash into it um, during slow wave sleep and only during slow wave sleep. So that's really a time to clear out the garbage. And um, so proteins are synthesized. I, that is you might imagine proteins need to be synthesized, you know, day and night, but in fact, it's really during um, that slow wave sleep period that they're synthesized. And you can see, you take an amino acid like lysine and, and radio label it. You can see how much radio label uh, your brain takes up in waking some, but not much during REM sleep, some not much, but during slow wave sleep, 
when growth hormone is also released in a big bolus, um, you take up a lot of amino acids to build protein. So it's a time when you're building the scaffolding that underlies everything in your brain. And also it's a time when you're building muscles. So athletes, you should definitely be getting your slow wave sleep. Um, and okay. So, but what I'll spend the majority of today talking about is REM sleep and the N2 transition to REM sleep states. When we're connecting things, new things that we've brought into our brains with old things that we already know, really important when we're learning and we're consolidating these memories and removing junk. So um, I'll talk about why that's, that's the case. So um, integrating and consolidating is that N2 transition to REM sleep and it happens through those sleep spindles. And then cleaning um, uh, through that theta activity um, and especially through that theta trough activity that I talked about a little bit earlier where you can depotentiate or weaken synapses and that uniquely happens during REM sleep. And then you can also reimagine and put things together that you might not have put together before for gaining new insights because the other thing that happens during REM sleep is that um, a lot of different things are activated that aren't necessarily activated together during wakefulness. And so your brain can put them together and strengthen them and have long-term potentiation through that theta peak activity. And I'll show you how my research has shown this. The questions that I've been asking is what characteristics of sleep might lend themselves and be important to memory consolidation? And what could go wrong in mental health disorders um, that are characterized by sleep disturbances? Can these traits that I'm describing today be targets for therapeutic interventions? And the answer is yes, with caution. And um, what are the critical experiments remaining? I think um, I would be excited if some of you decided you wanted to be sleep researchers and contributed because there are so many critical unanswered questions and experiments that need to be done. Okay, so let's go forward here. All right, so I moved um, for my postdoc to the University of Arizona where I learned a new technique called tetrode recording where you can record from tens of neurons all at the same time and see where they're firing in relation to that theta rhythm or in relation to slow waves or um, in relation to sleep spindles. And I recorded from these hippocampal neurons, I mean, neurons in the hippocampus because that's so important for learning and memory and making new connections. It's also pretty cool because the hippocampus in rats as well as humans um, forms a map of our environment. It's the associative learning and memory place. And in order to know where you are in a map, you have to put together a lot of things like you know, where your body is in relation to the environment around you, what time of day it is, what are the cues around you, um, all of these things we put together into a map. And so, and the way that the brain is expressing this map is by, a, um, if you can record from 20 neurons at the same time, you can tell where a rat is in any environment. So here is a track and the rat is running around on this track and you can see one cell is firing here, one cell's firing here. None of the cells you're recording happen to be firing here, although there are cells firing there, but it's just not the ones you're recording. Another cell firing here. All of these are different cells firing in different places. And you can tell where the rat is by which cells are firing and which are not. And you can do so with 95% accuracy with just 20 cells. And if you can record from 100 cells at the same time, you can be nearly 100% accurate. And as long as the rat is oriented, you can be oriented um, by reading out this, this messages that are being encoded by the hippocampus. It's, it's a really cool thing. And then you can see how these, this same map is reactivated during dream sleep. Are the rats dreaming about the maze that they were on? And the answer is yes. This is actually the most exciting thing they do all day is running the mazes for us. So you can imagine they're definitely dreaming about it. All right, so I want to just remind you that if the cells are firing at theta peaks, that's conducive to learning new things and putting things together. If they're firing at the troughs, you can get depotentiation or weakening of synapses. And that would be important for not sat saturating this important temporary memory structure of the hippocampus. So uh, it had been known for decades just from behavioral studies that REM sleep was important for remembering. If you didn't get REM sleep, 
right after you learn something new, you don't consolidate that new thing. And the next day when you test an animal, including a human on it, they will not remember nearly as well. So this is one of the reasons why you shouldn't spend an all-nighter um, before you take an exam, because even though while you're still awake, you may remember bits and pieces of what you uh, crammed into your brain during that all-nighter. Uh, the next day, once you, after you get sleep, you might not remember it well at all. And trust me, having done lots of an, an all-nighters as an undergraduate, you will not remember years later what the content of that course was at all. So <laughs> if you want to get your money's worth out of your undergraduate education, try and just study, learn as you go along, and then sleep each night to consolidate the things that you're learning. So, um, so there was also a, a paper by Francis Crick, a Nobel Prize winner, Francis Crick, saying that maybe what we do in REM sleep is really forget to desaturate our hippocampus. And so I wanted to test in Arizona whether that was true. I built a new maze where I could really test whether animals were learning something new or not. And so I had them running around on this track. And uh, these are eight boxes around on this octagon. And all eight boxes have some food in the bottom that they love. We give them Ensure. They love Ensure, you know, that vitamin mineral supplement. It tastes like a ground up Kit Kat bar with some milk, um, like a milkshake sort of. And rats love that. Although their very favorite food is macaroni and cheese, but it's hard to get them get that through a tube for them. So we, we give them Ensure on our maze. And um, we put that insure in three boxes that if they open the door, if they push open that swinging up door, they will be able to get to it. All of them smell like insure, but they can only get it in these three positions on the track. And then we have them run that track again and again, day after day, and they learn very well which boxes to visit and which boxes to skip because even though they smell like Ensure, they're not gonna get anything when they open the door. And we can see how the rat is mapping that environment when we take this maze and linearize it, make it a line. You can see which cells are firing in which places as they run. And then when they've learned it, we switch things around on them and place the uh, to food in two, accessible food in two other boxes. We don't change anything else. We just want them to learn something new in this familiar environment. And my analogy here is like my husband taking my favorite chocolate bars and hiding them on a different shelf in my kitchen. He would not dare throw them away, <laughs> but he might try and hide them from me. I put them on a new shelf. And um, so I learn where he puts the chocolate bars and I just access it from there, right? And that requires me to learn the new position in an old familiar place, my kitchen. And also it requires me to reduce the strength of my place fields for where the chocolate bar used to be. Cause I don't otherwise, well, I don't want to be checking both places. I want to go for where it is now. Okay. So um, this is called um, reversal learning. And that's one of the things things that I had my rats do. So I had them running a familiar environment and no matter, matter if it's familiar or not, you can see that the hippocampal cells, each one of these is a spike from a cell. Most of them are, are occurring at the peaks of this theta, ongoing theta wave that's happening when the rat is running around and, and learning. This is when the rat stops to eat the insure. So there's no more theta because they're in the eating mode rather than the exploratory mode and learning mode. And so the cells stop firing and, and there isn't um, a theta to measure. And then interestingly, what I found is that during REM sleep, so these same cells, if it was a very familiar environment and you know a familiar scenario, these same cells fired most of their spikes, these bursts of activity at theta troughs. So I said, wow, Francis Crick was right again. These cells are firing at the troughs of theta making REM sleep for erasing old memories that no longer need to be remembered. Um, they're irrelevant. They're stored in the long-term memory structures. They don't need to be in the hippocampus. They can, you can desaturate the, your hippocampus and, um, and clean it and clear it. Um, and so over the years, I've been chasing why this happens, how this happens, how it's possible that neurons can fire at theta troughs when normally they're silent. And so I've published a bunch of papers here. These yellow ones are ones from my labs, my lab. And then these are papers from other people that are also showing the same thing in, in different animals and in different tasks and using different um, techniques. All right, so let's see, why isn't this advancing? I don't even see my 
cursor. There it is. Okay, good. Oh, uh oh, I got the rolling beach ball of death uh, going. I hope my PowerPoint doesn't. Oh, okay. I just decided to, wow, really <laughs> advance. Um, I don't have my clock here. Okay, let's see. How much more time? I think I only have about 15 more minutes, maybe less if we want to do Q&A. So that's okay. I will, um, I will hurry along a little bit. Wow, my PowerPoint really is uh, protesting my involvement here. So while I figure out what's going on with my computer, I'll try and answer a couple of questions here, which is, um, Oh, yes. So there's a good question. Have there been studies done on how well people sleep based on their racial ethnic experience in the United States? And the answer, I just heard a lecture on this last last week. And um, the it's true that um, African American black people sleep in general shorter and for less amount of time. Oh, boy. And, um, and have more arousals throughout sleep. And it's not clear why this is the case, um, whether it's stress, but certainly stress has uh, an impact on how well we sleep um, or, you know, schedules or environment. Maybe, you know, if you're in the inner city with lots of police activity, certainly your sleep could be disturbed quite a bit more. And um, interestingly, how the memory and dream state is affected. Yes, I mean, this is a fantastic question. Um, it has been shown that if you, if a person who normally sleeps maybe six hours or seven hours a night gets just a little more sleep every night, like maybe one additional hour, even 45 more minutes, that happens when districts, school districts decide to delay school start times by an hour. Teenagers can get one additional hour of sleep um, and they do that. And what happens is that their grades go up, their grades go up you know, statistically significantly. And the people who benefit most from it are people who are from um, racial ethnic minorities. So they are the ones that benefit the most from a delayed school start time. Um, and all teenagers' emotional systems are um, better able to cope with the challenges of the day if you get another hour of REM sleep. Um, and that's what you get most of if you get another hour of sleep in the morning. Um, all right, so, uh, and I hopefully will get to in the next few minutes why that's also good for the emotional system. So this is the hippocampus in a rat brain. This is the uh, area in our brainstem that um, provides something called norepinephrine. Norepinephrine is a neurotransmitter that helps us to quickly learn about our environment around us. It's also very highly activated whenever there's a stressor. If you have a loud bang um, behind you, you, your locus cerullus will go ping, 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 and allow norepinephrine to saturate your brain so that you could quickly learn about what's going on and switch your attention to it, learn about it, and um, you know can do one trial learning. Um, the locus cerullus is off during REM sleep. So it's the only time when the locus cerullus is not firing is during REM sleep. And what locus cerullus does is it pushes everything towards long-term potentiation, making new connections, but it doesn't allow depotentiation or the clearance process to occur. So you really need it to fall silent like it normally does in REM sleep in order to be able to clear this temporary learning and memory structure of those old memories that have been consolidated. And so here's how the locus cerullus fires throughout waking. Here's how it fires in slow wave sleep, the transition to REM and REM sleep when it's really shutting, shutting off. Here's a firing rate in, in spikes per second in that intermediate transition to REM sleep and REM sleep and how it compares to slow wave sleep and waking in the animal. There's also that theta rhythm I talked to you about before. When norepinephrine is present, that the amplitude of that theta rhythm is about half as, as, as high. So this is the five to 10 Hertz, five to 10 cycles per second. You can see when norepinephrine is present, the amplitude of theta goes down and theta is really important for the synaptic plasticity like strengthening and weakening um, that occurs. So whether we either add directly norepinephrine into the hippocampus, theta goes down, or if we stimulate that locus cerullus using something called optogenetics, we also get the amplitude of theta going down. And another study showed that 
if they inhibited the amplitude of theta in REM sleep, and this is in a rat or a mouse, you can also get an animal that can't can't learn anything new. They saturate their hippocampus. They can't learn new things like where you've moved their chocolate bar to. Um, and that's, uh, that's what this study uh, by Richard Boyce did in 2016, a very nice study. So when we switch the place that we give them rats insure and then give them a, a norepinephrine or a drug that blocks the reuptake of norepinephrine, which is what some antidepressant drugs do, they leave norepinephrine out there, rats will not be able to learn the new positions very well. And that corresponds with the amount of that spindle state of sleep and the amount of REM sleep that they get. Um, this is a paper from 2012 that you can look up um, and find the answers to that. And if we optogenetically stimulate the locus realis, here's what it looks like, that tiny brainstem area um, back here in all of us. Um, this is what it looks like if we give it a viral vector that makes it sensitive to blue light and then shine blue light to make it fire, you can um, reliably make it fire, not, re not change, because if you stimulate it really slowly, you won't change the over amount, overall amounts of any sleep state, but you will definitely change the way that the animal can reliably encode their environment and and the stability which with with which that map is in encoding the environment and showing the environment and the ability for them to learn this new positions of uh, food in their maze and also it seems to mess up um, the reconsolidation of an old the old positions of their food so either on the familiar or their altered task these animals that had just a little bit of activity in this stress sensitive area um, during REM sleep, they were not able to encode new things nor erase um, synapses that were no longer relevant. Um, we didn't cause any permanent damage to their hippocampus, thankfully, because when you didn't stimulate that stimulated during REM sleep, they were able to learn a new maze just fine. But um, but it definitely messed up with, with, their, with their memory consolidation and reconsolidation. And here's an example of a sleep spindle that happens in rats. We have sleep spindles too, and the density of our sleep spindles, um, the number that we have per minute is a direct correlation with our IQ and our ability to um, improve our memory through sleep. So the density of sleep spindles is really important for our learning. and. Um, just a little bit of activity in this stress system of the locus realis is enough to mess up our sleep spindles and mess up our reconsolidation. All right, so sleep spindles are really an interesting thing. It's only been the last 10 years that we've paid any, any attention to them. And one of the things we found is that they, it's a really unique time when our hippocampus is connected to our prefrontal judgment and decision-making area in our prefrontal cortex. Um, these brief spindles are a time when the prefrontal cortex seems to be listening to the hippocampus and saying, what do you have to teach me today? What did you learn today? And let's consolidate it and help it to affect our, um, our performance. So one last thing I wanna just mention to you is back to slow wave sleep, um, because one of our questions was about depression and slow wave sleep. And um, so the, this stress sensitive system, the locus surrealis is um, normally active during slow wave sleep, but it's active at particular times in relation to those big sweeping slow waves that clean our, our brain with you know, the glymphatic system. And in, what that does is the locus surrealis fires right before um, a bunch of cells in our brain are active. And one of the reasons why our brain is being cleaned by, the, um, by slow waves is because um, all the cells are active at the peaks of slow wave and they're all silent at the troughs of slow waves. And what that does is all the neurons in your brain active at the same time and all silent at the same time causes, because when a neuron is active, some water rushes in and so they all expand. And then when they're all silent, they all contract and that causes a pumping action of our extracellular space. It pumps the waste out and pumps it away from our extracellular space into our glymphatic system. So. Um, the locus surrealis, when it's active, uh, just before the peaks, what it can do is, is it can release norepinephrine, have norepinephrine there at all the synapses to protect 
all of these synapses from being erroneously erased. So during slow wave sleep, you don't want to be erasing anything. You want to be cleaning, but not, you don't want to throw out the baby, baby with the bathwater. So you want to hang on to all of your synapses until you get into REM sleep when you can decide which ones you want to keep and which ones you don't want to keep anymore. And norepinephrine helps you do that. So any kind of treatment that helps you, uh, your REM sleep become more efficient has to be different than the kind of treatment that you give people during slow wave sleep. The locus realis, interestingly, is one of the first areas to degenerate in Alzheimer's disease and also Parkinson's disease, Parkinson's disease and any actually tauopathy, which are all these neurodegenerative disorders. And so um, maybe one of the treatments for for the memory problems of Alzheimer's and other tauopathies is to somehow find a way to protect the locus virilis so that it can do its job and protect your memories all throughout sleep. All right, um, the time is getting very short. There were other things I wanted to tell you, but I'm going to be giving some more lectures there at Wagner College over the next couple of days. And so I suggest if you want to learn more about this, come to those lectures if you possibly can. I'll be talking um, to Dr. Reynolds' history class, and I'll be talking with John's, I can't remember his last name, um, a biology class. John who? John Blaze. John Blaze's biology class. Um, so... Uh, you're welcome to come. But I guess one last thing I want to leave with you is how important erasing memories is for post-traumatic stress disorder. So if, for example, you're associating in the theater of war, a helicopter with danger, that would be, you know, um, a very reasonable thing to do. And the action of ducking and running, when you come back home, you will want to reassociate that and with something that's probably safer, like the news. And that process of reassociating Something that used to be one, one way, one schema in your brain with a new schema requires you to erase some synapses and you need good sleep spindles and you need good REM sleep and you need norepinephrine to be absent in order to allow that to happen. And um, so it appears that post-traumatic stress disorder and many other anxiety related disorders um, have too much norepinephrine during REM sleep and doesn't allow people to downscale those traumatic memories and learn the new associations. So, all right, uh, thank you very much for your time. Um, these are some family members of mine that have PTSD, which makes me really excited that I can contribute um, to, to this research. Um, this is my uncle Danny who um, passed away in 1974 after Vietnam. Uh, he committed suicide because he definitely had PTSD after that horrible experience. So. Um, so we're doing research to try and figure it all out. And I had taken these slides out, but my computer crashed, so they're still there. But we, we've got some good experiments. And this is my lab, and I just want to thank everybody here. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. OK, so, so Tina, thank you. That is really yeah. interesting. We have a few very interesting questions. Um, the question answer. Um, I'm going to let you go ahead and choose which ones um, you would like to answer, but so they run the gamut. Um, yeah. uh, Dr. Blaze actually has a question here. I assume if you don't get to it today, you can get to it um, this class on Thursday. But um, uh, do you have a minute to look at these questions? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, let's see. Right, let's see. So what effect does socioeconomic status have on sleep? Um, one of the things you need to get great sleep, um, because we are both predators and prey too, right? Human beings is, uh, we need a safe environment. If you want to get great quality sleep, we need a safe environment. So if your um, socioeconomic status, um, has you worrying, you're living on the edge, you are worrying about how you're going to pay your bills or whether you're even going to have a place to live and sleep tomorrow, then I, it's perfectly reasonable that your sleep would be compromised and would be probably filled with a lot more norepinephrine, um, which it would not allow you to clear your memory banks to learn new things. So yes, um, one of the things we're trying to do um, with firefighters in California who are frontline workers, um, of course, and um, ambulance drivers and police is to um, help them find a way to get better quality sleep when they can sleep. Uh, and one of the ways is to try and meditate um, or pray or whatever it is that 
helps you stop worrying and find peace before you try and get some sleep. Because if you're able to get some sleep while your locus surrealis worry and stress system is really still active, it's not gonna be the great quality sleep that you need in order for your mental health to be benefited the most. Um, there was a question about marijuana and why, and does it decrease the chances of dreams? Oh, that's a great question. There have been so few studies of marijuana because it's been classified as a whatever class one, um, uh, drug so long by the federal government, uh, very few people, very few researchers have been able to access it to do some research. But the little research I have seen shows that marijuana or cannabinoid type one receptors, which are, abound in your brain, um, you need them and you need endocannabinoids in order to be able to do this reversal learning task. But if you stimulate them the whole time during sleep, like um, smoking a joint right before you go to bed might do. Um, it, what, what it does is it changes all of your REM sleep into this transition to REM sleep. And those sleep spindles that are normally supposed to just be a one and a half seconds long every couple, you know, a couple times a minute, that in fact goes for many, many seconds at a time. Now, sleep spindles, I said, are good things. They're important for IQ. However, this prolonged, weird sleep spindle, we don't know what this does to learning and memory, and it's probably, probably not good. And it seems to replace all of your REM dreaming sleep. So, um, yeah, I would not recommend <laughs> um, chronic use of this, but uh, the caveat is, if you've got PTSD, in fact, it can prevent you from having the, um, the, the maladaptive type of REM where your locus surrealis is active. So um, it might be, we don't know yet, unfortunately, when the research hasn't been done, whether it would be curative. And from veterans who have talked to me who, who say marijuana is the only way they can fall asleep at all, um, it doesn't appear to be curative because as soon as they nights and they're not smoking um, um, pot, they are um, also finding themselves right back in the same nightmare cycle that they were in before. So not curative, but um, but it is gives us interesting cute clues as to what CB1 receptors are doing for reversal learning and and maybe we can devise a really nice treatment that's not such a hammer like like um, marijuana is. Uh, okay, so uh, recommendations for falling asleep. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, don't drink coffee. Do not drink coffee anywhere near the time you're trying to fall asleep because what coffee does is amazing. I talked about the conversion of adenosine to ATP, the energy packets. Adenosine builds up more and more and more. The longer we're awake, the more adenosine because the more energy we're using, right? And, and so, um, and it's the signal of high adenosine that makes us sleepy. So if, and, and what coffee does, it's an adenosine receptor blocker. So it masks our sleepiness. It doesn't actually replace the function of sleep at all. It just masks the fact that we're sleepy. It doesn't do anything to help adenosine be converted to ATP. So our brains have more energy. It just masks the need for sleep. Um, so anyway, don't drink coffee. Um, that's not a good thing to do if you want to sleep. For me, I can't sleep, drink any coffee. I'm fairly sensitive to it. I can't drink it afternoon. If I drink it afternoon, I won't go to bed until two in the morning. That's just the way it is for me. Other people can metabolize it faster. Um, another thing to do is have a, a regular bedtime routine where you are calming yourself. You know, you're, whether it's taking a nice hot bath or praying, don't watch TV, don't have that blue light, which resets your circadian rhythm and makes you think, you know, it's morning time. Your brain thinks it's morning time instead of evening. So if you um, are going to be watching TV or on your computer, have the blue light filter. So, cause it's blue light that activates our circadian rhythm. And um, so have a nice regular bedtime routine. If you're finding yourself laying in bed for 20 minutes and you're getting more and more anxious about not being able to fall asleep, just get up and do something, whatever is pressing on your brain, whatever you think needs to be done. If you're worrying about a test tomorrow, study a little for it, not all night <laughs> because then you won't have a long-term memory of it, but study a little for it enough to make yourself feel calm again so that, you know, okay, task done, I'll worry about tomorrow, tomorrow. Um, so that's that's the 
uh, advice that I have. Also, teenagers, don't don't beat yourself up if you're still um, your circadian rhythm still has you going to bed really late at night and waking up late in the morning. Just let yourself sleep if you possibly can. I do not use an alarm ever except when I absolutely have to. So um, if you can live without an alarm, I highly recommend it. <laughs> then you're wake up when your brain is ready. Okay. So we so we writes question about naps. Um, oh, there's great. some of us here who who you know we, we would love to nap, but our schedules don't permit it. Um, is is it a helpful thing? Is it? Oh, I highly recommend. If you like taking a nap, if you feel better after after a nap, then I would try and build in time in your schedule for that essential activity because. Some research by Sarah Mednick, who was at UC Riverside for a while, um, Harvard, then UC Riverside, now she's at UC Irvine. She um, has written a book and done some great talks. You can watch her on TED Talks. She's found that a nap can be as good as an entire night's sleep in terms of consolidating her memory. A nap, especially if it's long enough nap to include REM sleep, one cycle of sleep, that's enough to restore your ATP, uh, clean your brain a little bit um, with that slow wave sleep and consolidate those memories. And so one nap can be as good as an entire night's sleep. Now, I definitely do not recommend that polyphasic sleep where you're napping little bits, 20 minutes at a time all day long and never getting a nice solid period of sleep because it's that solid period of sleep that allows your brain to, to go into that wash cycle of, of slow, deep slow wave sleep and long enough. And then when you go into REM sleep, you're creating new insights and new connections that, and new debris that needs to be washed again. So you want to go through as many cycles as you can until your brain is done with its job and then you wake up. But, but yeah, I definitely highly recommend. And power naps, the little 20 minute naps, great um, for restoring the adenosine to ATP. So that really does give you power. It can it'll be much better than a cup of coffee if you can do 20 minute power nap instead because it actually does restore your energy and doesn't just mask the need for sleep. Alcohol, I see one uh, question about alcohol. Yeah, um, no, alcohol's effect on memory is very different from marijuana. It is more like actually sleeping pills. It activates your GABA receptors. Um, and But it's bad for memory because it also depresses these receptors that are really important for learning and memory. So. Um, and the other thing it does is it suppresses REM sleep. So alcohol, drinking a lot before bed, um, being drunk when you go to sleep, yeah, you will sleep, but it will be um, a kind of inefficient slow wave sleep that doesn't include REM and that normal transition to REM with all those sleep spindles. So um, definitely, definitely not good. Now, if you wanted to try take alcohol to try and get to sleep because you're anxious, um, I would recommend something else. I would recommend meditation instead, you know, deep breathing. My, my 11 year old just um, actually just turned 12. He, he just told me last night how he calms himself before going to sleep. And what he does is he envisions his breath as a, as shaped like an onion or maybe what are those kind of shallot, a shallot. So, you know, it gets bigger and bigger and then smaller and smaller. And if he imagines each breath is that, shallot um, and he can deepen and extend that breath, then he just he calms down really quickly. And I just love that imagery. So <laughs> I tried it too. It's very, very nice. Um, overweight, being overweight, interfering with sleeping. Yes, absolutely. Uh, because at least in men, the correlation between fat content uh, and, um, and obstructive sleep apnea is very good. In women, it's not as a good of a correlation, but for men, it's a very high correlation. And, you, and, um, and aging also, as you get older, being fat is worse for your uh, respiratory system because our muscles are all getting weaker and weaker as we're getting older. Every day, year after 50, I think there's a 2% loss in muscle tone. And you need that muscle tone to stay taut and open when you're trying to breathe when you're, when you're asleep. So if your muscles are weaker and you have fat and, and weight impinging on your, your airway, then you're much more likely to get obstructive sleep apnea. People with obstructive sleep apnea have to wake up to restore enough muscle tone to breathe. 
they wake up for just a second or two to breathe and then their sleep, the, the homeostatic mechanism forces them to sleep again, where again, their muscles relax and they're not breathing. And they can w- wake up $500, $500, 500 times a night and not even remember it. So the sleep is extremely inefficient. It's kind of like trying to trying to open the lid on your washing machine every couple of minutes while it's trying to do the load of laundry. It's just not gonna get your clothes clean and uh, you're not gonna get through the whole cycle in a, in a, in a proper fashion. So, um, so you definitely want to lose weight if at all possible. It's kind of a, what's a catch 22. If you're not getting good sleep, you're not going to feel energetic enough to exercise <laughs> and then you're going to be fatter and then you're not going to get good sleep. And it's a, you know, so if you do suspect that you have obstructive sleep apnea, if you're stopping breathing when you're asleep, which you can't tell yourself, you need somebody else to tell you, then um, definitely go to the doctor and get a, a, one of the cures for it is called a CPAP machine, which blows air down your airway to keep it open all night long. You get a much better night's sleep and, um, and then you can exercise and lose weight and then you don't need it after a while. So, ah, uh, dorms. Okay. Research best schedule and dorm set up for colleges to make sure college students get the best sleep to help them remember what they learned in class. Ah, uh, never heard of any research about the best dorm schedule. <laughs> So, um, but it seems like all of, of, of school is set up wrong in terms of how to best learn, especially if a nap is as good as a night for consolidating our memory, it really be, should be that we space every class by enough time to have a nice nap between it. Or, you know, we have one long class, the same subject all day long. And then the next day it's a different subject all day long so that we can consolidate the one subject at night. And the next day it's another subject instead of doing one subject after another, after another, another with no chance for consolidation. That's, it's setting up your brain for interference of learning. You know, one thing you should learn can push out another thing if you're not able to consolidate and stabilize it. So it really seems like your entire education system is based on uh, not the best, not the best way to learn. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, so many more questions. I don't know how much more time do we have. I, I see a lot of people are still here. I'm, I'm happy to continue answering. What do you think, Dr. Reynolds? Yeah, I think we have some time. I do. Okay, great. I think oh. this is really informative um, as sort of, you know, um, different people are sort of, you know, posing these questions. It yeah, makes, fantastic makes, questions. Yeah. Fantastic questions. Yeah. Okay. Oh, males and females love that question. Thank you for asking it. We are starting to do research on females. Unfortunately, the whole biomedical research community has ignored females for, you know, since it's established. Um, and that's one great thing about increasing diversity in the biomedical research field is that we realize that, you know, women are different a little bit from men and, um, you know, maybe the same drugs won't work. And um, one of the things that we're finding in my lab since we started looking at female rats instead of just male rats, is that the estrus cycle in humans, it's in the menstrual cycle, definitely affects how we sleep. So I talked about the sleep spindles and how they help us consolidate information and gain new insights. Well, women, uh, when estrogen levels are high, have many more sleep spindles. So sleep spindles are amplified then. Also the locus cerulis, which had only ever been studied in male rats before, and it has been shown to you know, shut off during REM sleep. In fact, in females at the low estrogen phases of their menstrual cycle, or we haven't studied it in humans, so low estrus phases of the estrus cycle in rats, the locus cerulis doesn't completely shut off in REM sleep at the low estrogen phases. So that might be why women are two to four times more susceptible to getting PTSD than men, because uh, maybe because our REM sleep locus realis is not shutting off. And so instead, after a trauma, if a trauma happens at a low estrogen phase, um, we're not able to get that nice type of restorative REM sleep that helps us reduce the emotionality of the traumatic memory. And so then you set it self up into a positive feedback loop where you're, where every day it feels like, because you're ever, aren't able to step down the emotional parts of that memory. Every day feels like the trauma just happened yesterday instead of, you know, years ago in some people. So um, yeah, so 
males and females, the brains are a little bit different and in interesting ways. Actually, women are more susceptible to many kinds of mental health disorders that, re, um, that involve anxiety. So, um, and it might be because the locus surrealis fear and anxiety center is not shutting off, you know, three out of or half the time when we're asleep. Okay, let's see. Oh, yes. Okay, so there's another great question by the same person about how sleep changes across our lifespan. We get a lot more of that REM sleep and transition to REM sleep state when we're young and our brains are, are, are learning brand new things about our environment and how to adapt to our environment. So when we're first born, our brains are kind of hyper-connected, over-connected, and what part of what learning is about is pruning away all of those things that are, are not important. And that happens in REM sleep. And then putting new things together, um, creating new insights, consolidating the things we've learned, building new scaffolds. That's in the not end to transition to REM sleep and then during slow wave sleep. So we sleep a lot more when we're babies and we need to. Um, let your baby sleep. If you have a baby, <laughs> do not wake them up because they're doing really important work during that state and you don't want to interrupt it. You definitely don't want to interrupt it to give them more stimulus. You know, you think you could create a smart baby by keeping them awake? No, in fact, it's quite the opposite. <laughs> you create a baby that misses important developmental windows by sleep deprivation. So uh, that's also another troubling possibility that in uh, people who live in war-torn environments or inner cities that are um, where survival is kind of about being awake, um, it could be impairing our children long-term for by not allowing them to build their the proper schema and regulate their emotional system like they need to during sleep um, by all of that sleep disturbance that might happen in those environments. Let me ask you a question about the pandemic. I'm going to jump the line here. Yeah. Um, but, you know, certainly this has been something we've been dealing with for over a year now. Um, and, you know, in some communities, uh, for some people, it's created a lot of anxiety. Yeah. Um, how, um, how do you think sort of the, the pandemic is negatively impacting the quality of our sleep? Um, you know, in that we're spending more time at home, we're getting less exercise, eating more, yeah. and then we have sort of the anxiety of the unknown. Mm -hmm. you know, catching, catching the virus. Yeah. Well, all of that is absolutely right. And a lot of people's sleep is disturbed and, um, and they're not getting the exercise they normally get. Exercise is fantastic for sleep. It actually, if you are able to exercise during the day, the quality, the size, the amplitude of your slow waves is bigger at night. So, and that's across the ages. So you definitely want to be able to get exercise during the day. Um, if you want to sweep away all that junk from your brain during the nighttime um, and anxiety levels are higher. A lot of people have lost their jobs. They don't know where their next meal is coming from. Some people have lost their homes. It's, you know, it's very anxiety provoking for those who don't have a stable job and don't know what's going on tomorrow. Um, there's a little bit of a good side of the same coin, however, because for example, um, if if you don't need an alarm, you know, to get you to work, um, and, or or you're able to, you know, your school for my sons, their school starts at nine instead of eight um, when it's remote learning, and um, so that has helped a lot of people get the amount of sleep that they need. Whereas before they're always sleep deprived, now they can get the amount of sleep that they need. So if you're not overly anxious about um, COVID-19 and all these effects. It has helped a lot of people um, le to become less anxious and less depressed. Um, so yeah, so it, uh, <laughs> I think it depends on what, you, what you're living with. Yeah. As you age, do you need less or more sleep? Okay, so that's a good question. Um, some people get more sleep as they age uh, because they can, they're retired and they don't need to go to work. Other people get more sleep because they are ill, they have cancer and or whatever it is. And you're in, one of the things that illness does is it increases your immune system's release of something called interleukins. Interleukins affect your brain and make you sleepy and sleep more. And that's good because one of the things I didn't mention is that sleep is really important for you, your immune system. So if you're sick and you're sleeping a lot more, it might be that you need that 
additional sleep to try and help you get better, right? So, um, and unfortunately, cancer is more abundant in, as you get older. Um, also, you might sleep more because your sleep has become less efficient. Maybe you have obstructive sleep apnea, which is something that goes up as you get older and you're not sleeping as efficiently. And so you're sleeping longer. Um, but on average, a normal healthy person actually sleeps less when they're old than when they're young and developing and lots of stuff is going on in your brain. Uh, but no matter what, how old you are, if you're learning something new, like say a new language, you will need to get more sleep in order to consolidate that learning. So um, yeah, so protect your sleep there. I, there was something, oh yeah, one other thing I wanted to say about sleep in the immune system is there have been a series of studies showing that if you vaccinate an animal that, um, and then deprive them of sleep that night after vaccination, vaccine will be 50% as effective as if you let them have a normal night's sleep. So, um, so if you're going to get COVID-19 vaccine, I suggest you sleep as well as you can, give, leave yourself plenty of sleep the night before and the night nights afterward. Um, treat yourself as though you have gotten the flu and just let yourself sleep in and, and laze around and relax because that will actually help the vaccine become be more effective. Interesting. We have a question about lucid dreaming. Uh, okay. Yeah. Lucid dreaming. Be careful. It's my only thing. When I was a kid, I, um, I had a repeated nightmare and um, my mother advised me, a very wise woman, to um, next time I had that nightmare, you know, because it was the same nightmare night after night, um, recognize that I was in that nightmare and then do something, anything to change the outcome. So it was a big monster running after me and my legs were like, there were molasses, I couldn't run away fast enough, you know, it's kind of a typical nightmare. And um, so the next time I had that dream, I was like, oh, yeah, this terrible nightmare. And what I did is I turned around and I shouted no to the monster instead of, you know, just trying to run away. And that was the end of my nightmare. I never had that nightmare again. So that was a lucid dream. And I would recommend it in that case. But however, what brain studies have shown is that in lucid dreams, a big part of our brain is actually awake, you know, to be able to recognize that you're dreaming and affect the outcome. There's enough of your brain that's awake. Um, and unfortunately that means that the, probably that those areas of your brain are not getting all the benefits of sleep. So do not, if you can possibly avoid it, lucid dream regularly, I would recommend because it's, there's too little that we know about it. And we can't do lucid dreaming studies in animals, unfortunately, because we can't ask them if they're dreaming or tell them to how to change their dream. Um, but, uh, but I would say just use it sparingly. If you really love to do it, you know, treat yourself to it once in a while, but use it sparingly. Um, yeah. Uh, one other thing I wanted to say about the immune system, sorry to return to that, but if we have any nursing students or, um, or, uh, a physical a physician assistants um, here is that hospitals are not made to optimize sleep, right? Talk about dorms, hospitals are even worse because in fact, you know, to monitor critical things like blood pressure, um, nurses go into the patient's bedroom maybe once an hour or once every couple of hours or at least twice a night, right? To see whether the blood pressure is okay. I would just counsel you if you're going to go into a healthcare profession to keep in mind that good sleep is good for the immune system and for recovery and the emotional system um, and memory system. So if you have a patient who's got delusional um, events after anesthesia, try and figure out a way to allow them to have a normal, um, a normal night's sleep and see how well that, that takes, how far that takes them. I know if you're in ICU, it's, there are more important things than sleep, like, you know, breathing and, you know, that sort of thing. If you're bleeding, you want to stop that. But, um, but if you possibly can project sleep, do so. Uh, and we have one final question, which I'll give to John Blaze. Oh, okay. Do you have it in front of you, Gina? Can you see it? Oh, yes, 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 I do. 
And slow wave sleep be prioritized or extended during the struggle between transition REM and REM to accommodate the soluble CNS toxins that accumulate when the lymphatic system is impaired. Oh, so this is uh, an intervention question. It's a good intervention question. And um, we don't yet know how to manipulate sleep to that extent. Um, we can actually, sleeping pills increase slow wave sleep, but what we don't know is that if it increases normal slow wave sleep and the normal function for the lymphatic system. It's quite possible that they do. And um, another thing that helps us fall asleep, especially as we get older, is to take melatonin just before bedtime. Um, melatonin is normally released in young, healthy people, you know, a nice strong you know, burst of melatonin that happens, you know, about half an hour around the time of sleep onset. Um, and older people, their amplitude of their melatonin release goes down and down as we get older. Um, so melatonin a supplement can really help older people get to sleep and then have some of that good slow wave sleep. Another thing, there's an interesting study done about 10, 15 years ago where they put old people who had poor slow wave sleep, really tiny slow waves, which is what happens. They put them in a wetsuit, a kind of wetsuit type thing where they were running water through between the layers of the wetsuit. And if they warmed old people's skin up by just half of a degree, their sleep was like that of a 20 year old. It was really interesting. They had beautiful slow waves. I mean, just beautiful. So it restored their slow waves. So, but then on the other hand, a lot of people sleep much better in a cool environments. So there's still some research left to be done. <laughs> some people say, oh, I can't sleep with my feet covered. I've got to have my feet cool. And that's, um, you know, understandable because actually also as we fall asleep, we also cool our system and that's thought to be important. But I don't, there's a lot of people who can't fall asleep if their feet are cold either. So, um, you know, there's just some research to be done. Anyway, those are some of the few things that you can do to try and improve your slow waves. Also exercise. Exercise helps the amplitude of those slow waves. But, um, but if you're sleep deprived, REM sleep and the transition REM sleep are going to compete with slow wave sleep to, you know, for time because you need those processes to, um, to happen too. So try and not be sleep deprived. So as a final thought, would you recommend that for students who are preparing for exams, that in fact, they go to bed early the night before their exams? Yeah, I mean, get a just, good night's sleep. yeah, just review, review, but don't, don't extend that time of review and then get a good night's sleep to consolidate that review so you can reconsolidate everything. Just don't cram like I did. Don't do what I did. <laughs> don't cram. I mean, I, I the reason why I had to do all night is I hadn't even read the material, you know, until the night before the exam. So yeah, there was not because I wasn't gonna be consolidating anything if I'd gone to sleep. There was nothing to consolidate. I hadn't put it in there in the first place. So don't cram. I, you know, there are whole courses that I don't even remember taking, honestly. <laughs> I look back at my notes and say, wow, I knew this stuff. <laughs> you were you were your own guinea pig. It was my own guinea pig, yeah. I mean. Procedural learning is actually not affected by sleep deprivation, so that system was fine, but um, actual content, yeah. yeah. All right, well, thank you so much, Dr. Poe. Yeah. This has been an enlightening sort of conversation uh, and lecture about sleep. We really have been so fortunate to have you as a Black History Month scholar. Mm -hmm. um, I want to um, thank everyone for um, sort of spending additional time with us to hear um, some sort of fascinating uh, information about sort of what's good for, for better sleep and, and what isn't so much. So thank everybody once again, and we'll see you soon. Yeah, thank bye you, bye. everybody. I'm going to save the chat and uh, maybe try and answer some more questions um, offline with Dr. Reynolds. Right. And so certainly if you are interested in sort of attending uh, my class or some of the other meetings that we have with Dr. Pope, email me um, and I'll see what I can do for you. Thank you all. Take care. See you later. <laughs>